Well, if you uh, haven't been with us uh, in the last few weeks, this is week two in a series that we're calling Just Us. We could say versus just us, justice versus just us. This is actually the second time we've done a a four-week series. It'll be the second of three times that we do a four-week series this year uh, on this, on justice versus just us. And that really comes out of a year-long theme that we've developed uh, just of an idea of lend a hand. And so just to give you a little framework there, if that's new to you, um, that's where we're at. Um, The first series focus primarily on racism. Uh, The second series is a little more directed at uh, the idea of the the poor, the needy, and the oppressed. And when we circle back to this series again in May, um, we'll have another topic. Um, I decided to title uh, today, The Real Justice League. And so many of you are probably familiar with these characters. Um, Most of us at some point in time, I've read a comic book, uh, seen a TV show, seen a movie. Uh, we're going to call these guys the wannabe Justice League. Um, because in all reality, they are. In as much as I can get all caught up in, and even a little bit addicted, maybe to a, a, a show or, or something that would involve just these stories uh, about unique individuals that are, are given a power and an ability to go and, and fight against uh, evil and darkness and, and have victory and, and bring, in a sense, justice uh, to our world. And yet today what I really want to talk about is, uh, is a real Justice League. Uh, but I would, I'd ask you to even think about before we begin why we would be really, truly so obsessed or, or even enticed and, and drawn to such fake and unrealistic um, characters and stories like this, I, I, I would argue there's something deep within each one of us that just aches to see real justice, so much so that we would, uh, yeah, get caught up in these stories. Um, I have a couple confessions to make before I really dive in. One is, is that, and I felt this way the last time that I got to, to talk and, and the first time we did this series, just really inadequate um, and, and incapable in a lot of ways in, in speaking to this topic of uh, in particular, the idea of social justice. Um, I can't speak to a, a ton of experience or um, education in this area. I don't have all the answers. Uh, I, I get nervous talking about it because um, I feel like I'm going to just say something ignorant, and I often feel ignorant. But I do, I, I know like you, I live in a world where um, this is a big deal, and it's a big issue, and that's why we're talking about it. Uh, but in line with that feeling of inadequacy, um, I shared a little bit that with, uh, with Brad this past week, and he kind of guided me towards a couple different things, and uh, he shares often from a, a, a pastor preacher in um, New York City. His name's Tim Keller, an author as well, an incredible guy, and he said, hey, you're, you're, you're preaching on Isaiah 58. You ought to listen to Tim Keller's sermon on Isaiah 58. So I did that late in the week, and I, I actually called and texted Brad and said, hey, this is really out of the box. But this, this sermon by Tim Keller is so good. Can I just play it <laughs> on Sunday? Like, I'm, I'm not really not trying to dodge out of my responsibilities. I promise I've been praying and preparing, and I'm just, I, I, you know, I'm not trying to weasel out of this, but I'm like, just about everything I could possibly, I mean, there were specific questions that I had jotted in my notes, and like, he, like, brought that question out and then answered it. And I'm just like, this is, this is perfect. And, and I told Brad, I don't, I don't know why I would need to try to regurgitate and, and, and paraphrase and plagiarize his, his sermon. And, and so uh, we went back and forth a little bit on that and then ultimately just decided, um, and I love the way Brad put it, but really I'm, I'm just going to share out a lot out of a lot of what I learned, primarily from Tim Keller. And, and I'll try to do a really good job of uh, letting you know a lot of these points, a lot of these ideas and thoughts were, were his. Um, and then there's obviously some mine that are, are tied in there as well. But um, I do, I want to give him credit and even kind of thank him because he did. He just helped me uh, <laughs> pull things together this week all the way from New York City. And I don't even know when he preached the sermon, but I did want to throw the link up there just in case if, if this is something you really enjoy or, or want to hear more. Uh, he goes a little bit longer, hopefully, than I will. Um, I, I hope to outdo, not outdo him in that. But, um, yeah, I, I, I don't go in, in, into some of the things that he does quite as deep. So some of you may just want to go listen to that. I did that on YouTube. Um, so here, anyway, so here, here's where we're going to go. I'd love for you to actually open a physical Bible because we're going to read through a whole chapter. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to 
tuck in and out of that chapter at times. It's Isaiah 58, as I already mentioned. And so if you could go to Isaiah 58 in the Bible, I actually think it would be helpful. Um, I will have everything on the screen as well, but because I'm going to be going in and out of Isaiah 58, I think it'd be great for you just to have it there all tied together because as it comes from me, will not be uh, too tied together. And while you're flipping, I know some of you will get there a little bit quicker. Um, I'd love for you to just pop your hand up quick, and it's okay. I know Jesus, in a sense, said when you fast, you know, keep it secret and keep it quiet. But just uh, out of kind of a random curiosity, how many of you have ever fasted? Okay, awesome. So here's my follow-up question. How many of you have ever truly fasted? And I ask you that question in hopes to jog some interest because the title of this chapter is, at least in my Bible, True Fasting. And so I would argue today, and I've, I know I was very challenged by this, um, you, you may reconsider or need to think about a little bit your, your approach uh, to fasting. And I think that's what God was after as he spoke through the prophet Isaiah. I uh, want to also say that I've got really four things uh, four rules, if you will, about doing justice and mercy God's way. And that's kind of how I ab- approached this Tim Keller sermon is that I was just really looking for, I just want to know what it looks like and, and really what justice is in God's eyes and, and how to do it and how to participate in that. That was really the desire of my heart after I heard Brad preach, preach last week is just, God, where are you leading me? What, what, do, you, what do you want me to do? And, and where do I start? And, and what is this about for me personally? And so... Um, Again, to be clear, a lot of this from Tim Keller, um, but this, uh, these rules I actually came up with. Um, the first one is that justice is a bigger deal than our spirituality. Uh, and so I'm going to read some of Isaiah 58. We'll just go ahead and pick right up in uh, the first few verses. We're going to read all 14 of them. Um, but it says, shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. And so uh, God is telling Isaiah, you are about to call some people out for me. People are in rebellion, and we need to let them know. Here's a little bit more about those people. For day after day, they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. And at first glance, This doesn't really seem to be people in rebellion. A lot of things that we would ask uh, of you as a church, day after day, seeking the Lord out. Eager, eager to know his ways. Intending to be a nation that would not forsake the commands of God, a moral, ethical, daily, prayerful, probably scripture, knowing, people. And as we continue, they ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you haven't seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you haven't noticed? And maybe in your own fasting, or maybe you're in your own prayer life, you have felt this. I would guess you have, because I have. I thought to myself, man, God, I, I, I sought you, I went to you, I tried to give this wholeheartedly to you, and then I, I just didn't feel like you responded or, or, or showed up. Maybe even in a season where I came day after day after him. And so again, the, it, it, it's hard to understand, and, and, and this group of people is struggling to understand why God isn't responding in the way uh, that they hoped. And again, we're, we're aware that they're in rebellion. As we move on, God's response, yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself. Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed 
and for lying on sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes. Is this what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? And so in my own notes, I wrote this is, this is religious. This is spiritual, but it's self-serving. It's showy. It's leading to or at least simultaneously accompanied by an exploiting and hurting of other people. It's insincere, and it's done out of selfish ambition and expectation. And that just led me this week to even praying through some of the times I fasted and my approach to those, and maybe even some of the things that were going on in my own life relationally as I, as I fasted. Here's a quote directly um, from Keller. Before I do that, let's go ahead and just read a couple more verses. Is not this instead, here we go, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, that God has chosen, to loose the chains of injustice and to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and provide shelter the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. And so I wanted to directly quote Keller here because you might not like what I'm about to say. And so if you don't, you can take it up with Tim Keller. He says, God is saying, If you think you have a relationship with me, but you don't have a relationship with the poor and oppressed, you are mistaken. Still quoting Keller. If you don't have a relationship with the poor and oppressed, you don't really have a relationship with me. A couple scriptures uh, Keller referenced that I will also reference to uh, reinforce this. First one comes from Zechariah 7. In 4 and 5 it says, When you fasted and mourned for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? And then a couple verses later, it says, Administer justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor in your hearts. Do not think evil of each other. And so there's a problem here. There's a religious life, a spiritual life, a walking after, seeking after God. And yet, something's missing. And God is not pleased. In fact, even in Isaiah chapter 1, God says, Stop bringing your meaningless offerings When you spread your hands to pray, I am going to hide my eyes. Why would God do that? Because people weren't doing this. And so he says, stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. And it's apparent that those things weren't being done. And so again, Keller Stuff I've just been chewing on all week. If you think you have a relationship, he's speaking uh, out of the place of Jesus here, just saying this is what he feels like Jesus is saying. If you think you have a relationship with me, Jesus, and you are not involved in the needs of the poor, if you think you are seeking me, but you are not seeking out the poor and the oppressed, you actually aren't seeking me. You do not have a relationship with me. Intense stuff. And so Keller says, why, why, why does God say that, and why would he argue that? And here's a couple, ver- a couple more verses he shares. Proverbs 14.31 says, if you insult the poor, you insult the Lord. Proverbs 19.17 says, if you give to the poor, you give to the Lord. And so if you tease that out, if I don't care about the poor, what might that say? about how I feel, truly feel about God. If I don't pay attention to the poor, what might that say 
about my relationship with God? If I'm not serving the poor, what might that say about my relationship with God? God identifies with the people at the bottom of the ladder, and then here is his last summary statement. God says over and over again in both the Old Testament and the New that if you think you have a saving, vital relationship with him, but you are not caring about the poor and involved in the needs of the poor, then you are mistaken. You can't. Because that's where I, God, identify. That's where I am, and that's what I am doing. He shares a couple quotes from Jesus. In both Matthew 23 and Luke 11, Jesus tells the Pharisees that you tithe and sacrifice and follow religious rules, but you neglect justice and the love of God. In other words, as religious as you are, as morally ethical as you are, if you don't care about social justice, you don't know, follow, or obey God. Uh, We looked at a verse from Matthew 25. I think we will several times over the course of this series. Um, Jesus is telling some that they fed him and cared for him, and he's telling others that they did not feed and care for him, and they're confused, and and the, the righteous answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we when did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? And Jesus will, the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did, for one of the least of those brothers and sisters you of mine, you did for me. And so hopefully you see uh, the connection. So I rephrased that rule, our Justice League rule number one, and I said justice is a bigger deal than our spirituality actually defines our spirituality. And I just ask you to think about that. It's a heavy, weighty statement. League rule number two. We need to know what true justice is, his justice. And I loved something that Keller uh, brought out. He had listened to uh, a guy that works uh, closely uh, with social justice in the government, and, and he talked extensively just about this conflict that exists in our world today. From Republican to Democrat to you name it, which is that your, your idea or opinion of justice may vastly differ from my idea or opinion of justice. And even though we are both passionate and desiring of, of, of justice, we want to see justice done. We, even in a church service this morning, could vastly differ in our understanding of what real justice would be in a given situation, what his justice would be. Um, as I thought uh, about this tension, um, I almost hesitate to admit it, but uh, I started to uh, get involved in a, a Netflix show on the superhero, The Punisher. And uh, I think perhaps um, a good illustration, a superhero, a man who, because of things that have, that have happened to him in his life, a lost family, and uh, in, in other things, his, his, his response as a superhero, his reaction is to kill anyone and everyone that was associated. And, that, and, and many would say justice, but others might not. And I had a hard time personally as I watched it thinking, this is, this is justice being taught. This is justice being displayed for the youth of, of our country perhaps my own household. And so there's a tension, there's a struggle. Um, These were Keller's, so I give him credit. He says, we can know for sure. He says, there's likely many, many more, but we can know for sure, without question, three things. And so I'm going to share those that are without question justice uh, given to us by Scripture. And I loved these three personally this week. They were just a breath there breath of fresh air for me, because as I already shared, I walked out of here last week just saying to God, this week, God, I kind of want you to show me, awaken me, uh, give me some ideas of of your justice and and things I can do, and and these three 
um, really fit the bill. I, I hope they encourage you as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the first one comes out of Isaiah. Uh, we're back in Isaiah 58. We're going to pick up where we left off. I'm going to back up, but I'm just going to say it again. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? And so the first one of these would be, uh, without question, equal treatment or racial and social equity. And Keller shares that this started in Genesis 9 when God said that anyone who would ever shed the blood of any other man would have his blood shed because for in the same image of God he had created all men. Continued in Leviticus 24:22 where God said you are to have the same law for the alien and the native born, for I am the Lord your God. So just about as far back as we could possibly go, God's heart, God's word, God's leadership of us was a a racial and social equity, something we talked uh, a lot about in the last time we went through this series. Uh, The verse here, would be when you see the naked to clothe him from Isaiah 58 and to not turn away from your own flesh and blood. The idea being that any and every human being would be thought of as your own flesh and blood. And uh, this was maybe an interesting experience for me recently. Uh, I I really like Del Taco. Um, If any of you are familiar with that restaurant. Uh, The closest one I know of is in Longmont. So anytime I go down I-25, uh, doesn't really matter the time of day, um, I'm going to make a stop at the Longmont exit, and I'm going to go to Del Taco. And so I've noticed the last few times I've gone to Del Taco, right when you exit towards the west, uh, right at the first place you would come to a light and then you'd turn left to go across the east side of I-25. The same, same woman uh, standing on the side with a sign, I would believe there to be given money or something. Um, usually somebody has a request for what they're looking for on their sign. This, this lady's sign, I think it just says beautiful, it's a beautiful day. And so I think that was the first thing I noticed about her, but I think the second thing I noticed about her is <clears throat> she just had, has this very uh, gentle, she's a bright, wide smile for one thing. Every time I've pulled up, she waves at every car. She even does little bows. And so the first time I, I remember seeing her, I just remember thinking, man, the next time I come through, maybe I, I've, I didn't have anything in that moment. I'm going to try to remember to have something. So the next time I went through, I, thankfully I had a few dollars in my wallet, and I, I just pulled them out, and I, I gave them to her. And uh, <clears throat> as I drove away from Del Taco and kind of watched her doing her thing uh, on the side, God, just convicted me in, in such a powerful way. And uh, I felt like he asked me a question. What would you do if that was your mom? What would you do if that was your wife? What would you do if that was your daughter? you just give a few bucks? Would you just wave? Or would you be doing anything and everything to get her off the street? And I'm I know I need to be careful with this in my own heart and mind because I'm not trying to guilt myself and say I need to go rescue this lady or that you need to either. But I'll tell you what, I had never thought of her or anyone else on the side of the road as my own flesh and blood. I never thought to care that much. If anything, I, I constantly think of people like that as so far and so distant and so unlike me. And I don't I don't do that intentionally. It just I can't relate, I I can't, I don't understand how I could. I'd be kind of nervous or ashamed even to to talk to them because I have and they don't. 
And God's saying, this is, this is our own flesh and, and blood. And so if anything, I know God is after heart change in me. And I hope he is in you as it pertains um, to justice. Uh, the second thing that we can know absolutely with certainty from God's word that is um, true justice is that the widow, the orphan, the oppressed, the needy are to get special concern and treatment. And I had never read Proverbs 31, 8, 9 this way, but I, I loved the way that, that Keller presented it. The verse says, Speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves, for the rights of all those who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. And I loved when Keller said in the sermon, he said, this is a command. It's a command. It's a step beyond equal treatment. There's a treatment of equality that should be expected amongst us, being one flesh and blood, but for those who need it, there's an even greater treatment that must be administered. It's not charity, but advocacy. This is a command. It is going beyond. It is speaking up. It is fighting for. It is caring for those who are vulnerable and weak, and it's making much of them. And this is without question God's heart for justice. It reminded me of 1 Corinthians 12, which says, One part of the body cannot say to another, I don't need you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker and indispensable in the parts that we, are think, that we think are less honorable, we treat them with special honor. In the parts that are unpresentable, are to be treated with special modesty. Why our presentable parts need no special treatment. And so we don't have to speak up for anyone and everyone because not everyone and anyone and everyone needs to be spoken up for. But there are some that do. God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked so that's number two that we can know for sure is God's justice. Uh, number three is sacrificial generosity. And so I will continue um, in Isaiah 58 to um, lead us to this. So picking back up once again, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with a pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry, and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. And so again, an idea of spending yourself. And there's, there's times that I uh, so adore uh, the vocabulary of the Bible. And, and I have just enjoyed uh, asking God, what does it look like for me to spend myself? And I just want to be a part of that. It just sounds awesome. I just would like a life that, that spends itself. And again, this is beyond token giving or even advocacy at this point. This is exhausting yourself, giving away your life. It's radical giving and sacrifice. It's not waiting for the government or our schools or some system or program to fix our society to bring justice. It's not just keeping the Sabbath or doing minimal spirituality while others are exploited. It's not obeying God and keeping his commandments out of duty, but rather giving of yourself freely, joyfully, and holy. Both holies. <laughs> holy as completely and holy as, as his holy. And so this idea, this third idea of, uh, of spending yourself um, is probably uh, the best transition to my, my third point, my third league rule, and I'm going to cr 
crank it up here a little bit, but um, just do it. Dispense justice. And I don't know if it was my football team or my basketball team or whatever in high school, but at one point we, we would say that to each other, we're going to go dispense justice today. And it, it, just, it just meant we were going to go take care of business. We were going to go get it done. And, uh, and, and I felt like, um, again, as I walked out of here last week, that I was just begging God, like, God, I, I want to do. I'm such a doer. I want to dispense justice. Uh, And I know I need to caution myself and be so careful because I'm just going to run ahead of him and his will for my life and and his plans. And his are so much better than mine anyway. And so I just said, God, this week, give me one little, just drop it in my lap, make it clear how I can dispense justice. And what he gave me was was so so perfect. Um, and it was just cool because I was just reading through Isaiah and, and, and trying to prepare for um, the sermon. And uh, to summarize it before I give you the scripture, God said, know my word. Then he said, tremble, tremble at my word. Obey it, humble and impoverish yourself, whatever that might mean, spend yourself, die to yourself, all for the sake of Jesus Christ and for others. But this is the verse he gave me. It's Isaiah 66, 2. He said, this is the one I esteem. He who is humble and contrite or poor in spirit and who trembles at my word. And I did. I just, I just tried to remember the last time I trembled at anything. And I couldn't really remember. And so then I started thinking about what would I tremble at? What would make me tremble? And I just hated saying to God, I don't, your word doesn't make me tremble, but it should. Man, it should. It has. And, and so I just, I just said, God, for, for me to dispense justice, I just want to love your word and tremble at your word like that. And then I know you're going to give me what I need to do. But it starts there with a trembling at, at him and his word. And so why dispense justice? Why is this so important? And I'll just say this, it's the gospel. The gospel at its core is justice. It is what has changed the world for eternity, and it is the only way we can eternally impact the world. It's the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. It's exactly what he's done for us It's why everybody is aching for superheroes and for justice. He became poor, needy, broken, fatherless, oppressed, mocked, despised, alone. He can relate to all of it. He lived a perfectly just life and then allowed justice to be dispensed upon him. In our place, he vindicated and redeemed and brought justice in the resurrection, and he's going to come and bring justice again. And that's why it's so important for us to continue being his agents of justice. So the last point, and then we're done, is that uh, you need to recognize your super identity and you need to use your super power. And I believe this is also found in Isaiah 58. So if you'll finish the chapter with me. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land, and he will strengthen your frame like Superman. You'll be a well-watered garden like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called, here's your superhero name, repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight in the Lord's holy day honorable, And if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, 
Then you will find your joy in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. The mouth of the Lord is spoken. And so, uh, my parting thought. This past summer, uh, my family and I got to go to California and visit the sequoias. Um, So it might be really hard to see because there's a giant tree that's most pronounced, but that's my wife, Michael, uh, little Charlie and Eddie in the middle, and then me and I've got little Matthew on the back. My question would be, can you see the oak of righteousness? I want to read one more verse for you. But can you see the oak of righteousness? The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. And I would argue, us. Because the Lord has anointed me, or us, to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me, or us, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives. This just sounds like a superhero. You are. And release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor in the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. That woman right there is an oak of righteousness. More beautiful, powerful, empowered by God than any tree. Each one of those boys an oak of righteousness that through whom God wants to do is justice. And yes, I'm going to stand up here and say I'm an oak of righteousness. I don't feel like that very often. But it's who God has called us to be. And maybe the more I tell myself that, the more likely I am to do some of his justice here on earth. So in closing, I just want you to know that God has made you an oak of righteousness a dispenser of justice. Let's pray. Um, God, thank you that for each person in this room, there's, just a, there's a different story. Um, there's a different purpose. There's a different uh, plan, God, for uh, the dispensing of justice. And yet, God, I stand before a real justice league of real superheroes who have been empowered by nothing other than your Holy Spirit. And God, if we are wise at all, we know that we are incapable of nothing apart from your Spirit. God, that we were as broken and oppressed and poor and needy as anyone could possibly be apart from you. And yet, God, you have met our need And God, if you haven't, if you haven't met that need, if someone here today realizes that, God, I do, I pray you'd lead them to simply falling on their knees, Lord, and begging for that. But God, in the the submission and surrender of, of our lives to you, you turn and you plant oaks of righteousness for your splendor and your glory. And God, I feel so grateful Uh, to have a place like this where I can feel like I'm a a tree in a forest. God, and that together we get to uh, be a part of what it is that you're doing here on earth. And so, God, I do, I just trust in, in the same way that you spoke to me, that for each person in this room, you just have a message that's simple and sweet and perfect, that's just the first step of uh, knowing you well and trembling at your word and hearing from you, God, what justice looks like for them this week. And then I pray we would just go and dispense it. So, uh, God, thank you that we have each other to lean on and to do that together with arm in arm. 
And thank you, God, that your spirit never departs from us and that you just continue to love us uh, even when we feel so incapable of doing your will. So thank you, Lord. We love you, and we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.